Right now, you can get 36 bucks off your subscription to Blaze TV Plus when you use the code STU Plus. BlazeTV.com slash stew is the place to go to get that. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to subscribe to the channel, like all the videos, hit the bell for reminders, do everything we ask you to do. It's the only, uh, it's the only you know, thing that will help the country, really. Daniel Horowitz is here to talk. Daniel Horowitz is here to talk about the latest in Israel and on our southern border. European eco-terrorists have ratcheted up their war on art yet again. I'll show you the insane video, but we're going to start by doing election 2024 countdown the final year. Yes. What was it? Yesterday was one year exactly until the election. And if you think we've covered a lot so far, can you believe that that's still coming? We have we haven't even had one round of voting yet. We haven't had one primary yet. We have a whole year ahead of us. Now, on Wednesday, we have um, the debate. And, like, the debate on the Republican side has become such a low-energy event. Like, they're not even covering it really here at The Blaze. They're just going to be like, hey, uh, Stu, you could do some stuff on YouTube. So I'm going to. I'll just do some stuff on YouTube. I'll give you your debate uh, coverage, maybe some pre-show, maybe some post-show. We'll talk about that a little bit later in the week. That's coming up. I'm going to be doing Megyn Kelly show, show uh, that week. I've got uh, I'm doing Glenn Beck show on uh, Wednesday as well. So there's a lot going on, and we'll have a lot of coverage for you if that's what you want. But I want to start here with really an earthquake. A massive, massive big deal. A poll from New York, the New York Times and Siena. Let me give you some, go through some of the details and we'll talk about what this actually means and uh, why we care right now about this particular poll. And, uh, you know, I know a lot of people don't care about polls, but this one you should care about a little bit. Uh, it's Trump leads in five critical states as voters blast Biden. A time Siena poll finds voters in battleground states said they trusted Donald J. Trump over President Biden on the economy, foreign policy and immigration. As Mr. Biden's multiracial base shows signs of fraying. That's one way to state it. Let me give you just the top line results here from these six uh, states. These are the six biggest swing states that will probably decide the election. And, you know, you never know. Every once in a while, another state jumps into this batch. But this was this is a good summary of the six that really matter. And I particularly like these polls better than like a top line national poll. I, I don't get as much out of that. But here we go. You've got uh, Nevada, Trump 52, Biden 41 in Georgia, Trump 49, Biden 43 in Arizona, Trump 49, Biden 44 in Michigan, Trump 48. Biden 43 in Pennsylvania, Trump 48, Biden 44. And in Wisconsin, the only one with Biden ahead, Trump is at 45, but Biden is at 47 there. One thing you'll note about these six states is that Donald Trump lost all of them in 2020. So these are states that he lost in 2020 and now are five out of six are in his favor in 2024. And look, you know, there's a lot of things you can say about Trump, Donald Trump and some of the policies he's had that, you know, that were successful. Some you might not like, whatever. That doesn't even matter. If this election is fought on whether Joe Biden is doing a good job as president, as this poll seems to indicate, at least early on, uh, then Donald Trump's going to win. That's the most likely outcome. If it becomes about Donald Trump and the, you know, the mean tweets or whatever he sent before, I didn't like his, his appearance on you know, Celebrity Apprentice season three. If that's what it's about, uh, though, then maybe Donald Trump will lose. But if it's about Joe Biden and his record, then Donald Trump will probably win or whatever Republican uh, wins the nomination will probably win. We'll get into some of the polling on the other candidates, DeSantis and Haley in particular here in just a second. But let me give you some more on the uh, on the big findings from this New York Times Siena poll. Discontent pulsates throughout the Times Siena poll with a majority of voters saying Mr. Biden's policies have personally hurt them. A majority of voters have said personally Joe Biden's policies have hurt them. That is incomprehensible for a candidate to have to deal with. Um, the survey also reveals the extent to which the multiracial and multigenerational coalition that elected Mr. Biden is fraying. Demographic groups that once backed Mr. Biden by landslide mar margins in 2020 are now far more closely contested as two thirds of the electorate sees the country moving in the wrong direction. Well, what does that mean exactly? Well, core elements of the Democratic coalition are saying, look, we tried this thing. It didn't work. Let's do something else. Voters under 30. This is something that is massively a, a pro-democratic group. They, uh, they favor Mr. Biden in this poll only by a single percentage point, 
His lead among Hispanic voters is down to single digits, and his advantage in urban areas is half of Mr. Trump's edge in rural regions. And while women still favored Mr. Biden, men preferred Mr. Trump by twice as large a margin, reversing the gender advantage that had fueled so many Democratic gains in recent years. You know, I mean, if you go back to the 2020 election, you break that stuff down. You know, there's a lot of talk about what happened in, let's say, Philadelphia or Atlanta. But where the actual changes in votes occurred was in the suburbs of a lot of these places. I mean, you know, in just a couple of suburban Philadelphia counties, more votes uh, were switched that, than, than Biden needed to win that election. It wasn't in the cities where Trump actually outperformed his 2016 numbers in a lot of the cities. It was actually in the suburbs, and it was a suburban women, uh, largely, who just said, you know what, I, I don't like Donald Trump. I want to try this thing with Biden. Well, that's going away. Um, while they still favor him slightly, uh, women uh, and female voters, uh, that is, it's decreasing. And, of course, the other side of that, some suburban men who are like, eh, I don't really like Trump, have come back to the other side. Black voters, long a bulwark for Democrats and for Mr. Biden, are now registering 22 percent support in these states for Mr. Trump, a level unseen in presidential politics for a Republican in modern times. You know, the Democratic coalition is built the foundation of it is built on completely dominating specific groups, right? 95% of black voters. Uh, I, the number was even a little higher than that for Barack Obama, if I remember right. But it's usually between 92 and 95%. You start getting 78% of black voters, this whole coalition falls apart. Hispanic voters, usually 70, 80, 90%. Now it's more like 50-50. When that happens, that's a massive hole in the coalition. This is happening over and over and over again. Let me give you a couple of other... Uh, stats from this poll that are really pretty remarkable. Um, for me, uh, the big one, I mean, probably the biggest takeaway, they have problems with Biden's policies, of course. Uh, the economic stuff especially, maybe we'll get into that in a second as well. But the age factor is really just wreaking havoc on Joe Biden's election. And again, if he seemed competent, if he seemed coherent, then perhaps this wouldn't be such a factor. But the fact that he comes off this way to basically everyone, it's not just you and I. This is not just some conservative YouTube channel thing. This is not some, oh, Blaze TV, they're a bunch of right-wingers. The left is seeing this as well. For Mr. Biden, who turns 81 this month, being the oldest president in American history stands out as a glaring liability. An overwhelming 71%, I mean, this is a massive number, 71% said he was too old to be an effective president. Now, you might say, well, that means, what does that mean, 71% won't vote for him? No, of course not, because a lot of people who don't think he can be an effective president are still going to vote for him. That's the country you live in. In fact, a remarkable 54% of Biden's own supporters say he's too old to be effective. Now, you might say, well, Donald Trump is also old, and that's actually pretty much true, certainly historically for presidents. Um, he is 77 years old. He will be the same age that Biden is now if he wins another term, right? He'll be 81 or 82, something like that. So in contrast, only 19 percent of supporters of Mr. Trump view him as too old and only 39 percent of the electorate overall. 71 to 39 is that split. When it comes to the president's uh, supporters or the, uh, uh, I guess, of uh, both presidents, the, num the split is 54 to 19. Uh, these are numbers that can't be reversed. You can't, you can come up and, and solve a problem. Maybe you come up with a great policy that calms down the Middle East. I doubt that's coming from our, our president right now, but who knows? Maybe it could happen. Um, it's not, he's not going to find the fountain of youth. So this is a massive, massive, massive problem that has no solution, I believe. We'll get into some of the suggested solutions from some of the Democratic supporters here in a second. But it's also the economy. The economy is really dragging him down. Voters under 30, a group that strongly voted for Mr. Biden in 2020, said they trusted Mr. Trump more on the economy by an extraordinary 28 percentage point margin um, after years of inflation. And we know how bad things are. Less, this is incredible. Less than 1%. Less, not 1%, less than 1% of poll respondents under 30 rated the current economy as excellent, including zero poll supporters in three states, Arizona, Nevada, and Wisconsin. He went O for the poll 
in three of the six states. Hard to get reelected when that happens. I'm not, you know, you might not be, a, wait a minute, I'm not a political consultant. What does this all mean? It's bad. Believe me, it's bad. You don't want these numbers going into an election. Now, what can Biden do? This is fascinating to me because uh, the New York Times also had a, uh, a newsletter out this morning uh, from the morning newsletter. What can Biden do? This, the president's strategic options for 2024. And they lay out four of them. Um, one is, a, hey, blame everything on Trump. They call it the anti-MAGA majority. The Roe factor, okay, lean on abortion. Uh, it seems to work for us in some of these states. Issue weaknesses, uh, well, we need to press back and change our strategy on that. And the age problem, what do we do about that? They actually suggest he should get out there more. People should see him being energetic. That's the worst thing you can do. The more that people see uh, Joe Biden, the more they remember what he's like and what he's like is bad. You don't want him as your president. And that's been the problem the whole time. But I want to focus on the issue weaknesses part here for a second. This is one of the things that was uh, highlighted uh, to me when I was w reading this. This jumped off the page to me. Listen to this. And again, remember what this is. This is not some conservative saying, hey, this is what I think of the Biden presidency. This is a left leaning writer on a very left-leaning publication trying to explain to its very left-wing readers what, how to solve this stuff. But, so you're not going to agree with all the kind of assumptions in this. I want to set you up for that. But listen to what they view the situation is. A president can't do much to bring down prices in the short term. This is talking about gas after they wrote about the inflation problem. Yet Biden has taken steps to reduce energy prices. Now, Obviously, we would not agree with this. He, he approved a, an enormous new oil project on federal land in Alaska while enacting billions of dollars of subsidies for clean energy. I don't need to, to point, to you, point out to you that that does not lo lower energy prices. Billions of dollars in subsidies to green energy does not lower energy prices, but that's a whole other story. He is pursuing the sort of all of the above energy policy that many Americans favor. Now, time out just to point out the obvious He's not pursuing that strategy at all. Um, he is, he, he, because he approved one freaking project, he's also been a disaster for uh, fossil fuel companies. Everybody knows that, blah, blah, blah. And I don't even know if they're even making the argument here that it's real, but they are saying, hey, he could point to this to voters in the middle and say, hey, I'm working on this. I'm doing X, Y, and Z. Here's what they, how they lay it out. He has been strangely unwilling to brag about the Alaska project, as Matthew Glacius noted in a recent Substack newsletter. Biden seems more focused on avoiding criticism from climate activists than on winning over swing voters who can help reelect arguably the most climate friendly president ever. Again, the assumption at the end is bonkers insane, but you get what the point is. Why, if Biden wants to win an election, is he playing to climate nut jobs, the extremists way out on the side, and trying to not offend them rather than going to the middle and saying, hey, wait a minute, I've also approved this oil project. Why isn't he bragging about that more? There's more on this front. There's a similar dynamic on immigration. Undocumented migration to the U.S. surged after Biden took office, part, partly in response to his welcoming campaign rhetoric. And many Americans are unhappy about the surge. Although Biden has since taken steps to reduce the surge again, Remember what we're talking about here? This is someone on the left talking to other people on the left. Uh, he rarely emphasizes these popular steps. Again, he seems more focused on progressive activists than on swing voters. You could say the same thing in some ways about the developing dynamic on the left uh, with the Palestinian Hamas supporting squad type people. Why is he pandering to them far too often? Now, they don't even think he's coming far enough, to be clear, but... For people who support Israel and don't like the murder of a bunch of babies and children, uh, he hasn't come far enough to support Israel, and yet he's playing to the activists. Why? Why is that happening? Um, uh, well, I think a lot of this is him guarding his left uh, side. He realizes that someone could still jump in, like a Gavin Newsom, that could really pressure him from there, and that's that's at least part of this. Um, now, the, the, the Times also has a, sort of a... A uh, struggle session, a, a coping session here. Uh, Trump indictments haven't sunk his campaign, but a conviction might. Um, one of the th theses that they kind of bring up here is that uh, if he's convicted, if Trump is convicted of like the January 6th thing, 
that would swing some voters. Not that many. About 6% of voters would say, you know what, I can't vote for Trump anymore. I'm going to go back to Biden. That would be enough to swing him to victory in these states. So that is notable. Um, It would be enough for him to at least swing to victory in the Electoral College if everything falls the way that we would think. Let me give you a couple more of these. Um, On abortion, Biden is everywhere from up from four points to about 15 on the issue of democracy, it's pretty much even, honestly. I mean, you think of all the time they've spent bashing uh, January 6th. It really hasn't worked very well, with the one exception of Wisconsin, for some reason. It was a 13-point margin. Israeli-Palestinian conflict, all pro-Trump from point plus three to plus 14. The economy is all Trump, plus eight to plus 29. National security is all pro-Trump with the, again, the exception of Wisconsin, the one state that Biden did okay in this poll in, um, from plus 12 to plus 18 with the one exception of Wisconsin. And in immigra- for immigration, it's all Trump plus six to plus 19. Think of how much political capital they spent on saying, well, this guy said Mexicans are all rapists. All those lies, all that time. And people favor Donald Trump by massive margins. Now, as far as the primary goes, it's, it's a little... Uh, like everyone's talking about Trump is already the nominee, which is sensible considering he's up by so much. But of course, we haven't had any votes cast yet. So the assumption is a little early. And what you see when you look at the all the candidates, you know, Trump is losing one state here. It's Wisconsin. He's winning in five. Haley is winning all six states by much larger margins in, in most of them than Trump. And DeSantis is not behind in any of the states either. Two of them he is even, but he actually is even in two and then up in four. Trump is up in five and behind in one. Haley's up in all six. And if we could just find whoever this generic Republican is, everything would be easy. A generic Republican leads in every state from between 14 and 18 points. I mean, that is... These aren't even, that's not even swing state territory. Of course, the generic Republican doesn't actually uh, exist. And if anyone's close to that in this group, it's probably Nikki Haley, who hasn't really had her record torn apart like some of the others. But we'll see if that holds. Um, you know, look, people don't say they don't care about polls. And I understand that. I understand why you might not like them or whatever. But think about this from the left wing perspective. This is not a Rasmussen poll. This is not a Trafalgar poll. This is the New York Times Siena. This is like, you know, one of their gold standard polls. The New York Times is saying this is going terribly. And now we're seeing reports of Democrats expressing deep anxiety as polls support trailing Trump. Let me give you a couple of quick quotes because we're running a little late here. Richard Blumenthal, a Connecticut Democrat, said he was concerned before these polls. And I'm concerned now. David Axelrod said, Only Joe Biden can make the decision of dropping out. He's talking about dropping him out, having him drop out. If he continues to run, he will be the nominee of the Democratic Party. What he needs to decide is whether that is wise and whether that is in his best interest or the country's. So what do we know from this? Who is this good for? Obviously, this is good for Donald Trump uh, in a big way, because the biggest problem he might have Going into this is, is he electable? Well, this is this poll is saying he is. It also helps probably at some level Nikki Haley, who had really good polling throughout and honestly continues to poll very well all over the place uh, she, as far as uh, her general election side goes. Uh, who's it bad for? Well, Biden, obviously, uh, he looks really, really bad at this point and is incredibly vulnerable. Remember, the left looks at this as, oh, my God, they're going to put Hitler in office. Now, a little asterisk about this. They seem to appreciate Hitler's policies recently. So I don't know if Hitler's the best example for me to use, but you know what I'm saying. They think Trump is really bad. And this is catastrophic to them. Um, It's also bad, I would argue, for DeSantis. Now, DeSantis' polls are just as good as Trump's in in this particular uh, poll. However, the best, maybe the best argument for DeSantis was to say, hey, Trump can't win. He's going to lose if you nominate this guy. He's going to lose. And he doesn't have a great argument in that he's you know, behind him in several of these states. So it's hard to make that case, though he has to uh, continue to make it anyway. It's also probably good for someone like Gavin Newsom, who would be maybe the alternative if uh, Biden drops out. It's questionable for America, all of this. Obviously, Joe Biden is bad enough. We've got to get him out of office. Uh, however, but it probably does make a stronger candidate more likely to actually be the opponent of whoever wins the Republican primary. Um, You know, maybe Gavin Newsom. Glenn's kind of threw out there Michelle Obama as a potential candidate, someone who uh, can, um, you know, maybe be 
you know, to the left without having all the baggage of someone like Joe Biden. That's on the table as well. So that's what we're looking at. That's this kind of the state of the race right now. I did talk to you also about some of the stuff going on in Israel. I want to go over that now more in depth with Daniel Horowitz. He joins us next. Let me tell you about Ladder Life Insurance. Ladder is 100% digital. Uh, There's no doctors, no needles, no paperwork if you're applying for $3 million in coverage or less. Just answer a few questions about your health in an application. Now, you might say, I'm so sick. I don't want to do something like life insurance. It makes me think about dying. Well, you know what? Because it's going to happen at some point. You better be prepared for it. And Ladder Smart algorithms work in real time to help you find out if you're instantly approved. There's no hidden fees. You can cancel any time. And if you get a full refund, you'll get a full refund if you change your mind in the first 30 days. So there's not really any risk getting started. Probably pretty smart to get started, though. Ladder policies are issued by insurers with long proven histories of paying uh, paying all sorts of claims. And they're rated A and A plus by AM Best. So you're going to get paid out if you need it. Hopefully you don't need it because life insurance is one of those things you don't want to necessarily cash in on, but you got to be prepared. Life insurance costs more as you age, so now is the time to do this. Ladderlife.com slash stew. Go there today. See if you're improved instantly. L-A-D-D-E-R life.com slash stew. Ladderlife.com slash stew. Check it out now. Ladder Life Insurance. I'm happy to welcome Daniel Horowitz back to the program. He's a senior editor for TheBlaze.com and host of The Blaze podcast, Conservative Review. Also author of Rise of the Fourth Reich, Confronting COVID Fascism with a New Nuremberg Trial. So this never happens again, along with Steve Dace, which is available now wherever you get your books. Daniel, thanks for coming on the program. Hey, great to be back with you, Stu. I really appreciate it. Um, let me let me rewind a little bit because we haven't had you on since October seventh. Give me a fifty thousand foot view of this. I mean, try to put some perspective on this historically. Sure. I mean, this has been going on as we well know for fourteen hundred years. Uh, jihad uh, has meaning to it, and believe it or not, it's not just a few people who believe in it. It is unfortunately a widespread belief to varying degrees in the Islamic world. Um, It was always kind of speculated what would have happened had the Israelis failed, their military failed during the Six-Day War in 1967. And I think we kind of have an idea now. Uh, They will literally kill any Jew they see in sight that they have the ability to kill. And that just underscores, A, the need for the creation of Israel and obviously the need for their security apparatus. Um, Where where we stand now vis-a-vis our government um, as it relates to Israel, look, the Obama administration spent eight years trying to forge an alliance with Iran. The Biden administration is obviously continuing and building upon those policies. They are not about to allow the massacre of 1,400 Jews get in the way of that relationship. And I think that's the most important thing for people to understand. Biden's not going to openly sound like Ilan Omer or the, you know, the Jihad squad in in the House. He'll say Israel has a right to defend herself. Uh, You know, it's terrible what went on there. But what he's quietly doing is hamstringing their ability to fully annihilate Hamas, deter Hezbollah, and ultimately really deter Iran. And that's something I think Republicans in Congress need to be keenly aware of uh, the alliances this administration has made. It's got to be reversed and more important than sending Israel money, which, you know, kind of does divide the right in terms of foreign aid. It's undoing the policies that put Israel in this peril to begin with. You wrote a great column about this. I want to get to some of that here in a second. But but let me go first to the reaction to this uh, from the media, from the left. I mean, it has been revolting. Uh, it's hard to overstate how disturbing it's been that there seems to be a, a sizable portion of our media, our, certainly our universities, our younger voters, who are pro-Hamas in this back and forth, which seems incomprehensible to me. Does any of this surprise you, Daniel? You know, yes and no, Uh, Stu. The the biggest observation I had from this is that before Israel even announced their intention to do anything, this was on the Saturday itself, you already had mass demonstrations 
in major Western cities. And I was thinking, well, what are you demonstrating against? Israel didn't even do anything. <laughs> and that's when it hit me. They actually felt empowered by what happened. It's not like they're upset with what happened, but they still are anti-Israel and they think, you know, the Arabs d deserve the land or whatever it is. No, I mean, they actually support what occurred. Um, that degree of massacre and barbarism is supported by a large percentage of these people. There was this signal poll that showed, showed 57% of U.S. Muslims felt Hamas was justified in what they did. And, you know, this might be deemed to a lot of people as an Israel problem, maybe a Jewish problem, but it's also a Western problem. This is everyone's problem. I mean, we have let this subversion into our country, certainly into Europe in hundreds of thousands, and then now they're mixing with the native left, and it's forming this just virulent anti-Semitic, anti-American, anti-moral uh, trifecta between sort of BLM, Antifa, and this pro-Hamas sentiment, and they're all merging. If you've noticed, they're using the same tactics. They're blocking streets. Uh, they're having violent protests. Obviously, they're able to deface uh, White House property like they did over the weekend. And of course, they don't you know, get locked up for 17 years. Uh, so so this is a Western problem that we now have to deal with. Um, you know, Israel is dealing with the kinetic problem, but we have the subversion problem on our soil. Yeah, I mean, we saw that. It just reminds me, as you're talking about this, the, the professor who eventually tried to back off of this, but described these events as exhilarating, right? Like he thought it, it was exciting that, that Hamas was going out and doing these things. And these are things out of like, you know, a, a, a Saw movie sequel. Like these are like horrific, torturous acts against oh, yeah. completely innocent people, not, not soldiers, not military targets. And this was looked at as like, oh, wow, we finally got some. I, I, like that is a, I mean, it's unbelievable that that sentiment still exists. And we are told constantly, Daniel, that it's the right that has these sentiments. <laughs> and you know, look, there are some on the right that have really ugly thoughts. You know, we saw that in Charlottesville. They reminded us about Charlottesville every 10 seconds. Charlottesville, Charlottesville, Charlottesville. There's 25 Charlottesvilles every single day across America right now. And no one seems to care. You know, a lot of people on the left that, that don't believe in genocide and another Holocaust are, are going to very quickly taste the flavor of the fist of, of Antifa and the left uh, because, yeah, I mean, it is pretty shocking what they believe. And, you know, one of the little known facts of what went on in Israel is this area, my understanding is that was attacked, is kind of the equivalent of, the, of America San Francisco. They were very left wing. Um, they were big peace activists, largely. And there were all sorts of stories how they would help transport Gazans to Israeli hospitals and have all these sort of coexist uh, peace kite flying carnivals. And they even went out of their way to hire some of these individuals and they were given these green passes to come over from Gaza. And then it turns out a lot of them uh, aided Hamas in telling them exactly how many people were in each house, where their safe rooms were. I mean, th this is hopefully in Israel, from what I could hear and understand, they are waking up and, and smelling the jihad. Uh, the question is, has this gotten personal enough in the West uh, for those of our friends on the left to realize? And I, unfortunately, I don't think it has. Mm. Uh, the kind of crazy left brings me to Rashida Tlaib, who has been maybe the, the most bonkers person in our politics so far is relating to this. Uh, these incidents. Um, she, over the weekend, accused Joe Biden as being part of a genocide, basically saying that he was supporting Israel too much. Now, that's, that's not my read on Joe Biden's position, frankly, uh, but it is hers. And th there is a schism on the, on the le uh, left here. Like, it does seem like the squad has um, one part of this wing, I mean, is there any difference between the normal, you know, the average left wing Democrat and the squad on this? Or is it just a matter of semantics? No, it's sort of it's sort of like the Biden and admin officials are like the Muslim Brotherhood. And then Tlaib is, is like Hamas. <laughs> One is the forward advancing guard for the other. And, and it's really like this on a lot of policies. They have that part of the party shift the Overton window over really quickly. So the public's not ready for that. But then that allows them to secure ground permanently. That's maybe not quite as radical, but then inexorably it moves to the left. 
I mean, you look at the outcomes. This administration has gone down. They told Israel three things. Biden told Israel three things when he was there from my from what I've heard from my sources. Number one, uh, you can never identify Iran as the culprit of the attack. Number two, no preemptive strike on Hezbollah, even though Hezbollah is already killing people with a low intensity conflict in the north. And then number three, you have to always allow uh, humanitarian aid to Gaza. Now, if you've ever seen some of the um, videos of the tunnels, a Russian media was given exclusive access to it. I mean, that stuff is billions of dollars worth. Where do you think it came from? It came from that humanitarian aid courtesy of our taxpayers and Europeans as well. Um, he stopped Israel from shutting off their internet. Okay. If, if you understand the modality of Hamas's warfare, it's all built upon what? Human shields. Well, human shields are worthless if you don't have a PR campaign accompanying it. So he ensured that they turn on their Internet so they can continue this. Uh, there's now evidence that during this humanitarian corridor they set up, uh, Hamas used that to launch uh, anti-tank and mortar attacks on, on the Israeli forces. So, I mean, this administration is pretty hardcore. <laughs> Um, it, it really is. And, you know, th their number one goal is to maintain the alliance with Iran. The secondary goal is to uh, knock out Netanyahu and install a left wing government there. I mean, just to give you some sort of context uh, th throughout the last year, the administration has been funding what's called Brothers in Arms. It's Israel's version of Antifa. They're the ones fighting for a judicial oligarch. If you remember that in the spring, Netanyahu was trying to uh, just institute very modest reforms that bring Israel's judiciary closer to America's system, but more of judicial supremacist than even our system is. And you had all these massive protests funded by our government, funded by Soros. Even after October 7th, Tony Blinken went over to Israel and he met with brothers in arms. I mean, it's unbelievable from a diplomatic level. So, I mean, this administration, I would argue in many respects, is more dangerous than Ilan Omer because I think with, with someone like Ilan and Tlaib, you know what you're getting. Here, they're bear-hugging Israel into what's essentially a full Nelson and uh, hamstringing them in their goal. So it's very perilous. I just saw before I came on, Stu, that Axios is reporting the Biden administration made Israel promise that if they're going to buy M-16s from American uh, vendors, they cannot hand them out to individuals living in Judea and Samaria for protection. Wow. So, I mean, these guys think of everything. I mean, that is unbelievable. Um, one last one for you here, Daniel. Um, you had a great column. Uh, it was called uh, 10 America First Ways Congress Can Stand with Israel. This is an interesting part of this because obviously, you know, the the energy on the right right now is, is for example, against f more additional funding in, in Ukraine. Um, but this is uh, obviously a closer ally in Israel. There's a different relationship yep. there. There's there's plenty of differences we can discuss. But what are the ways that are consistent with that sort of America First view that can help Israel through this? Exactly. Aside from all the obvious differences between Israel and Ukraine, you know, Ukraine, despite over a hundred billion dollars and who knows how much from the Europeans, they still cannot seem to accomplish anything. Whereas here, the Israelis are making a lot of progress in Gaza. They could do it on their own. And that's kind of the point. The point is that I don't think we should divide the right. I think a lot of people genuinely want to support them, prevent another Holocaust. But no country, and that includes an ally, includes Israel, should have an automatic draw upon our bankrupt treasury. We're, we're bankrupt. We're out of cash. So the point I was trying to make is I'm not against, per se, giving, giving more aid to them. But what's more important are the policies. It's sort of like our border. If you throw $30 billion at DHS under the current dynamic, it would actually go towards catch and release. So everything we talk about with the Biden administration, you send them money, yeah, it will enrich Lockheed Martin, they'll get their contracts, Israel won't be able to use it because the Biden administration will hamstring them. So to me, what I, what, what I think is more important for Republicans in Congress to do in the budget bill is to cut off funding to Gaza, cut off funding to the Palestinian Authority, cut off funding to the Iran deal, cut off funding to the Lebanese armed forces, which there's a lot of evidence that American counterintelligence assets given to Hezbollah is what blinded Israel to the training in, in, in Lebanon that took place. Um, obviously, we need to undo Biden's alliance with Qatar and, you know, bring our bring our troops out of 
uh, Syria and Iraq. This is another important one. A lot of people think that the neocon interventions are driven by pro-Israel sentiment. But in fact, the opposite is true. For 40 years, America has been hamstringing Israel because we can't dial up the temperature in the Middle East. Why? Well, because we have assets on the ground. Well, we shouldn't have those assets on the ground. We're in Syria and Iraq right now, about 4,000 troops, and then tons of money defending Lebanon, uh, Syria, Iraq. They are enemies. They are taken over by the Shias. We're defending the Shiites from the Sunni insurgency while the Shiites attack us. I believe there's been uh, several dozen attacks, 46 U.S. soldiers injured over the last two weeks. Mm. I don't know what they're there for reasons only Allah understands. It harms Israel um, because then it complicates their ability to strike Iranian assets coming to re uh, rearm Hezbollah in Syria. Get out of there. Minimalist approach to the Middle East. Defund the bad guys. Let Israel do what they want. And we focus on our border. Hmm. Uh, let me let me um, direct you to a couple of uh, Daniel's uh, columns over the past couple of weeks. Uh, uh, Ten Amer- America first ways Congress can stand with Israel, and also pro Hamas sentiment among young Americans is a big problem. Goes through all the polling of like what we're actually facing here. Uh, is it's really an issue that we're going to be dealing with for a very long time. Daniel Horowitz, be sure to su- subscribe to his podcast, Conservative Review, and pick up a copy of his uh, book. Rise of the Fourth Reich, confronting COVID fascism with a new Nuremberg trial, so this never happens again. Daniel, thanks so much for laying this out for us. We appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Uh, Let me tell you about Upside. Upside is a great app if you happen to be someone who buys, like, food. Do you buy food? Have you ever bought food before? If you've bought food before, you're going to love Upside, especially I went to Panera the other day uh, with the kids and uh, it was me, my two kids and my wife. We bought two cups of soup, a mac and cheese and a salad and it was forty six dollars. We live in crazy times. Now, with Upside, you can get cash back on every purchase that you make. You can get started just getting the Upside app and use the promo code STU. You'll get an extra twenty five cents back for every gallon on your first tank of gas. You can claim an offer for whatever you're buying on uh, Upside and you pay as usual with your credit card or debit card. Follow the steps in the app and you get paid easily. In comparison to credit card loyalty programs, you're getting like three times the cash back with Upside. Plus, Upside does not sell your personal information to third parties. They know this is part of their trusted relationship with you and they want to protect that. Uh, Download the free Upside app and get the promo code STU. You'll get an extra 25 cents back for every gallon on your first tank of gas. That's an extra 25 cents back. Uh, you're probably going to need that. Uh, use the promo code STU. Uh, save money with the Upside app. The promo code is STU. Save today. It really, like a lot of things amaze me, I suppose, that shouldn't at this point. But like the way they're reporting what we were just talking about with Daniel, uh, the Israel-Hamas situation is really amazing to me. Let me give you this headline from CNN. More than 10,000 killed in Gaza Hamas-controlled health ministry says as condemnation of Israel's campaign grows. Now, look, this is actually an improvement from their initial reporting, where they were just saying it as if it was fact. And they're saying now at least the Hamas-controlled health ministry says. It's no longer just the Gaza health ministry. It's Hamas-controlled. So we know that this, there's some flavoring going on with whatever numbers uh, that they're giving you. But my question is, why are you reporting that at all? Who cares what Hamas says? They are not a reliable narrator, okay? I I mean, how about this? You're CNN. You've got uh, multiple billions of dollars to invest in news coverage all around the globe. How about give us the number that you verified? Have you verified 2,000 dead in Gaza yet? 1,000? Do you have any number that you actually believe or are you just giving us what they say? Who cares what they say? Hamas is a bunch of terrorists. They're not a reliable narrator. This is not even like saying like, uh, you know, some government we kind of disagree with. This is Hamas. Go in there. If they're such loving people, go in there and find out how many people are dead and give us that number. Do some reporting. Call it journalism. Give that a whirl and let us know what you find out. 
don't tell us what Hamas says because it is of no value. Let me tell you about Undertack. Undertack isn't your typical, and these aren't your typical men's boxers. These are made with modal. What is modal? I mean, think of it sort of like cotton, but much better. It's 50% more moisture wicking. It is antibacterial, and it's way, way softer. They're really nice. And Undertack stays in place with a sturdy, yet comfortable, extra-wide waistband and a straightforward fly design that is brilliantly designed. You're going to like this. Undertack is durable, ultra-light, fade-resistant, and shrink-resistant. Plus, they're 25% less uh, than some of these uh, competitors. And Satisfaction Guarantee uh, is there for you as well. If that isn't enough, they donate a portion of their profits to organizations actively fighting against human trafficking. So pick up a drawer full today. Head to undertack.com and use the code STU20. There, you will save 20% off the entire site, exceptional comfort, and twice the guarantee at a fraction of the price. The promo code is STU20 for 20% off uh, site-wide at undertack.com. I love these things. You're going to love them, too. Get a bunch of pairs. It's undertack.com, undertack.com. This code is STU20. You know, one of my favorite segments on this program is idiots gluing themselves Two things. And this was kind of came from the climate uh, protester thing where everyone just started gluing themselves to sidewalks and stuff. And I thought it was hilarious. So we've highlighted as many as we could. But I have to be honest with you, unlike CNN, we're not just going to make up the news when we don't have it. And we have not seen recently climate idiots gluing themselves to things. It's a huge disappointment. I think potentially Bidenomics has made glue too expensive. That's my theory, uh, at least working theory right now. But they're still doing stupid crap to art. So let's watch some of that. It is time for deeds and not words. It is time to just stop oil. Politics is failing us. Politics failed women in 1914. If millions will die due to new oil and gas licensing, millions! If we love history, if we love art, and if we love our families, we must Stop. Oil. All right, enough. Um, amazing. Uh, the people who are telling you to love art just smashed, uh, you know, the encasing of a painting there, of course. But uh, I got news for you. Millions are not going to die because you got new oil. Uh, in fact, probably a lot will live. You should read uh, the Alex Epstein book. Uh, that'll inform you exactly uh, what the goods are when it comes to fossil fuels. But Look, I mean, it's just not as exciting if they're not gluing themselves to stuff. Here, they're just going to get arrested. That's boring. Glue yourselves to things. I will not take a climate argument seriously unless there is glue involved. We all remember the horrific wildfires in Maui back in August and Joe Biden's horrible response to them. But as bad as that response was, you haven't been told the whole story. Luckily, Blaze Media decided to go to Maui and expose the information that was buried. This is the very first edition of Blaze Originals, a docu-series from Blaze TV that's going to be exclusive to Blaze TV subscribers. If you haven't already subscribed, you got to do it. BlazeTV.com slash Stu. Subscribe. Don't miss our first episode, What Really Happened in Maui. Use the promo code Stu Plus. You'll get 36 bucks off. It's BlazeTV.com slash Stu. Promo code is Stu Plus.